Well, I hope everybody is refreshed now and has and, and invigorated not only by our first panel, but also by uh, very good networking that happened over the lunch break, I saw. Um, I have a very easy job now because I think this is going to be a great panel for two reasons. One is because we are uh, presenting brand new OECD work on industrial policies. And two, we have Katrin kluver eschbrook as a moderator, who's not only the best of moderators, but also a very uh, well, well-known connoisseur of transatlantic policies. And I know uh, it will go very well. Katrin, the floor is yours. I'm looking forward to this. It's on? Yes. I'm having a moment of deja vu because I was literally here not a week ago to talk about the transatlantic climate bridge. So um, if I saw you then, welcome back. And if uh, I didn't see you then, welcome to this discussion. I'm grateful for uh, the OECD to have us all on this panel. You know, industrial policy uh, was, I think, you know, certainly during the 80s and 90s, the heyday the policy that shall not be named, the kind of policy we didn't want to talk about because we understood our businesses to be vastly in the lead. It was so out of fashion that you would think about it, any sort of state interventions at a grand scale that the market couldn't really truly steward, at least from the Western perspective, uh, what we were going to need in the world. And now, of course, the state is back in the business of business. And so that's why I'm really uh, interested in not only the numbers that our colleagues from the OECD will present, but our panel discussion afterward, not least, of course, in the transatlantic context, uh, in an environment in which Europe is trying to find itself and push very forward uh, solutions potentially on the green component. The Americans have come out, right, with uh, an Inflation Reduction Act that is currently setting the standard on how we think about subsidies and how we think about how we get things done. And that has led to interesting effects in the transatlantic sphere, as you know, uh, heated discussions among countries within the European Union, but also dollar signs on the corneas of some of Germany's core manufacturers, I think only of the machine builders and others who will say to you very honestly, there is no green transition in the United States without German machine building. So we are going to probe all those questions with an excellent panel that I uh, have coming up uh, and will bring to the stage here momentarily. We're going to listen to Chiara's presentation. Um, but we also really want to probe in the data that Chiara is going to present to all of us. Again, what can these interventions and the type of interventions actually deliver? What are these debates uh, that we are seeing about overheating systems, this race between China, the West, and the rest as it manifests on the industrial policy piece? And of course, we're all finding ourselves in Berlin this week, and I think sort of the critical juncture for this issue uh, we came early in the week from the decision of the German government to support the building of an Intel new plant with a 10 billion euro subsidy, with everything that comes with that, in terms of how that raises the cost of that individual piece of labor, um, and raised question about whether the state truly understood industrial policy in a future-bound industry. So I can't wait to get into that with my panel. But we've also just stepped off the biggest industry conference here in Berlin, where that clash between does the state understand what businesses need or do businesses need to dictate to the state how this can function was on full and open display. And meanwhile, Finance Minister Christian Lindner has been glued to the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe because he is trying to figure out what of the COVID aid and transformation packages he can pull over into the kind of new potential investment practices that Germany in this transformational time might need. So with that, I want to bring the panel to the stage to listen with me to Chiara's data. So if you are on my panel, I will introduce you when you are sitting here, but I'm looking at you individually, and then have Chiara come up and present her findings. So 
if we could go ahead and do that and we'll all take our seats here. So I will introduce quickly Chiara, if I can. Uh, she is going to present some absolutely brand new data. Um, Chiara Criscuolo, Crisu oh my goodness, Criscuolo, Criscuolo, <laughs> did I get that right? I should have practiced earlier. Uh, is the head of productivity, innovation, and entrepreneurship uh, of, of that division and the director for science, technology, and innovation at the OECD. I read this paper with great interest. It's going to raise a number of questions for you. So listen closely. Thank you, Chiara, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, let me thank uh, you know, Cornelia and uh, Nicola, but Brian as well, who is listening online and is sort of the, the shadow behind everything. I hope we can see him before the end of the day to, to thank him personally. Uh, let me say also a big thank you to the team who is behind this work. As you will see, it's a huge amount of work, and so we had a, a big team. And, and in particular, let me mention Gil Alan, who is sitting with us today, but also Luis Diaz, uh, Charles Edouard Van den Poot, and Luis Guilouet, who are listening, I'm sure, online. Uh, and the whole, you know, what we call quiz team, quantifying industrial strategy team. As Catherine said, we are really, uh, this is a preview. We are really launching this project today with you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some cross-country results with a special focus at the end on the green aspects of uh, industrial strategies. But you know, you will see for those of you in the room today, we also have some country notes, uh, sort of fact sheets here and some country notes online on our website and we also have all the data that you will see summarized in some of these graphs today is also available uh, online and you know i hope everybody can make use of it so let me uh, start and and i mean hopefully if i manage to make this work i don't know where i need to point okay here uh sorry let me okay so I think, Catherine, you already gave a bit of a, what we say in Italian, a bit of a la to, uh, you know, why industrial policy is important. I think why this work is particularly timely. And as you say, after, I would say, decades of uh, industrial policy being banned from any policy discussion and even uh, academic work, we are finally back uh, in the arena. And, uh, you know, the big question, however, is since this was the policy not to be named, and it was really a taboo. I think there is still a lot that we don't know. Uh, and so our approach was to say, OK, we need to start from basic and really provide a very comprehensive overview of what industrial policy is. And so we started with the very basic, which is, what is industrial policy? So an answer to the what question. And so uh, the idea was to do so by providing, first of all, a definition, which I'm going to show you in a minute, but also to provide a full framework on what industrial policy is. The second question is, do we have any evidence that it has ever worked? And so we also provided uh, a review of uh, the evidence on industrial policy and whether it has been effective. Both of these papers are available on our website. And then we finally went to answer the question, OK, how much do governments really spend on industrial policy? And, and to do so, the first thing we tried to do was to develop a methodology that was commonly agreed amongst uh, both policymakers and academic experts, and so uh, you know, we, we did this uh, this methodology work, and then we actually went and measured things. So this is really the result, the quiz uh, database that you are going to see uh, today. Now, the good news for us, at least, is that we have made an impact already, and in fact, the framework was already used to rationalize. Uh, the uh, industrial strategy of France uh, in their uh, France 2030. And then we have used it ourselves to support government in their policy making. And, you know, uh, just to link also with Antoine's presentation before, we have helped them in analyzing and, and, and better understanding uh, the needs behind uh, industrial strategies for green hydrogen. And then we went on as well and focused on particular countries, in particular the Netherlands, but we have, uh, you know, more, more countries that we are going to advise on 
how to use industrial strategy in a coherent way to de decarbonize uh, industry, in particular the manufacturing sector of, of the Netherlands. And actually the government has followed some of the advice uh, that uh, we gave them and, and uh, Antoine presented the SD++ measure, which really came and was changed to, to sort of according to our, uh, to our comments to their policy uh, in place. So let me start with, as I said, the very basic a definition. So we wanted to give a broad definition of industrial policy because we wanted uh, to, to take into account that we are not anymore in the old regime. We are now in a new industrial policy regime. And so we wanted to provide a broad definition that tried to capture, uh, first of all, that industrial policy today is not restricted only to the manufacturing sector. It includes both horizontal and targeted policy. And I leave you uh, the definition there you can, you can read. The point here is that really the goals of the new industrial policies are not just to improve the competitiveness of the domestic sector per se, but also to, and so, you know, focus on productivity and economic growth and innovation, but also to improve other elements of the performance of the business sector, including its resilience, uh, the strategic autonomy of the sector, which I'm sure will come up uh, later today uh, in the panel. And you know, last but not least, really uh, focus on achieving this green transition and achieving uh, the sustainable development goal. And let me also mention that, especially in some of the measures that probably will be discussed today, there is an element of providing the workforce with good jobs. So that's something that, you know, sort of achieving inclusive development or making the green and the digital transition inclusive is an important part of this new uh, industrial policy. So we wanted to have a definition that includes all of this. Now, let me uh, give you the numbers. You have them, and I mean, I will do what uh, our old Secretary General used to do, uh, Angel Curia, like I will show you the, the paper here uh, that you can find online, and, and as I said, here in the room. So let me show you some of our main uh, results. So let me start with the why question, then we go to the what question. So the goal, you know, when we started this work was really to improve three main elements of the uh, industrial strategies of countries. The design, we wanted to provide the measurement and we wanted to, our ultimate goal, improve on the evaluation performance of uh, countries uh, you know, in, in their industrial policies. Now, the immediate objectives of the quantifying industrial strategy project was really to start by standardizing the measurement. And so that's why we did this uh, methodology paper, and this would then allow the increase in transparency of the industrial policy expenditure of, of cross countries. And this would allow, on the one side, to benchmark industrial policy across country, which I think is very important when we have this international uh, discussion. But let me also say, and uh, what I would call a positive unintended effect of our project, we actually improved the coordination of policies within countries. Now, uh, to me, that was a surprise, but in fact, when you think of the way industrial policies are often done, they are done by different ministries that operate often in silos. And so by quantifying how much each one of them uh, is, is spending on, on particular areas or on particular priorities, we actually allow a better coherence of the whole industrial strategy within the country. And then by providing you know, a quantification exercise, this was really a first step towards uh, better evaluation and really putting evaluation and, and quantification in the mind of policymakers. So there is still a lot of work. This is a first step, but I think it's a good first step to take. So how, uh, let me say how we do it, we collect information on uh, nine countries that now have agreed to participate and you would see uh, which ones they are. We actually have four uh, G7 uh, countries, and we have collected more than a thousand uh, policy instruments per year over the 2019-21 period. These are instruments that uh, are above the threshold of 0.002% of GDP, and the source of our information is actually publicly available information. So the, the, the big effort was not only the collection, but then the harmonization of the concepts of, of the measure. And, and as I said, we followed our, our agreed methodology. Uh, 
And then we managed to sort of collect and, and classify this information in different instrument types. So we have grants and tax expenditure on the one side, and then we have financial instruments. And then we classify these different expenditure according to the eligibility criteria. So we have seven digital green, you see them listed here. One important point that I would like to make is that each industrial policy tool that is not necessarily classified according to a single eligibility criteria, but you have, and, and you will see it, sectoral policies that actually have a green component or sectoral policies that have a, a digital component. And so, you know, when once we have collected and classified this data, we went back to our country expert, did some quality check with them, uh, the data was verified, and given the period that we have an analyzed, as you can imagine, COVID measures played an important role and, and were really sizable in the period that we analyzed. So I, I'm not going to talk about those today, but they are available again in the report. We collected information and we classified information on those as well separately. So let me now uh, go to the main results uh, and let me start uh, by saying one important, I think if you just get out of this presentation with this main message, I will be happy. Industrial policies are actually sizable. So when we look uh, on average across the uh, nine countries that we have analyzed, 1.4% of GDP on average in, in, in 2021 is actually spent on grants and tax expenditure and 0.7% on financial instruments and, and the financial instrument figure actually excludes uh, export finance. So that's the first takeaway. Second main takeaway, there is a lot of heterogeneity across countries, including, uh, you know, across European countries. And, and let me, uh, you know, mention Three, three, three points on, on, of heterogeneity across countries. First of all, in the amount that they spent. So you see, for example, if you look at the UK, you have 2.3% spent on mainly tax expenditures and grant. You know, you go to Ireland, you see 0.6%. Second uh, main uh, difference is what kind of tools do uh, countries use? Again, you see very clearly some countries are very much focused on, on tax-based uh, tax and, and, and grant instruments. Others have a much more, I would say, balanced uh, strategy. And you know, if you look at the case of Italy, they have about 1.7% on grant and tax expenditure and, and financial instruments represent about 1.8% of uh, GDP. And even within those grants and tax expenditure, you, you, see, uh, you see some difference. And in fact, when you then look at the priority, you see even more heterogeneity in the choice uh, of priorities uh, across countries. And here it is. Uh, so you see that what we report in the, in the uh, dotted lines are the minimum and the maximum to give you an idea of the heterogeneity across country. And then the uh, continuous uh, blue line is the average across country. And then here we put on the spider graph all the priorities that uh, you know, are touched upon in, in the industrial strategy of different countries. So first main, main message is that on average 30% of uh, grants and tax expenditure, because that's what we are focusing on uh, in this graph, is going to uh, instruments that have a sectoral uh, component. So this is something that is very, uh, very, uh, I would say, evident uh, in the data that we collect. And then you have the other priorities, R&D, green, jobs and skills, SMEs, etc., that have about 10 uh, to 20 percent. Uh, and then finally, we have the digital component that represents a much, uh, a much smaller, uh, less than 10 percent of the uh, total expenditure. As I said, lots of heterogeneity across country. Let me mention, for example, the case of jobs and skills. France spends about 35% of their total uh, grants and, and tax expenditure on, on jobs and skills, mainly to lower the cost of uh, labor for firms, but also to, if you want, reward or incentivize uh, the use of apprenticeships in, in their firms. Israel, you know, it's about 1%. So you see very big differences across the countries that we look at. Now, uh, we said that 30% of the uh, total grants and tax expenditure actually has a sectoral component to it. So let's look at which sectors uh, are targeted. Uh, and, and you see very clearly that energy uh, represent a big share of the, uh, of the total expenditure. And then you have transport followed by manufacturing, etc. Now, 
First point, you don't see a lot of targeting towards services sector. They are supported through more horizontal uh, measure. Secondly, when we look at energy, most of this is actually through uh, green grants. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's about 60%. And then, uh, you know, manufacturing about 20% goes to, to you know, to uh, supporting the green transition. Much less is going to transport in terms of green. Why? Because most of the support is through uh, fuel tax rebates, which for sure are not green. Uh, and, and, you know, to support also the maritime uh, sector. So, uh, you know, I think this is an important message because you see that, for example, green is very much uh, going through sectoral support as well. And let me get back to this uh, in this graph, uh, where we see that uh, you know, in across across countries, uh, when we look at, uh, as I said, horizontal versus sectoral component, you see that the energy sector accounts. Uh, especially in Italy, Denmark, and France, uh, for a large uh, share of supports to, uh, to the uh, green transition. Now, one good news, and, and you see it quite clearly in, in, in the graph, is that on average there has been an increase uh, from 0 0.22 to 0 0.24% uh, percent of GDP of uh, support going to the green, uh, to the green, uh, to green instruments. Uh, now, you see there are some exceptions. Now, the good news is these exceptions are just temporary. Uh, in particular, let me mention the case of the Netherlands. Uh, 2021 was a year of transition from the much narrower SD plus uh, type of uh, incentive to the SD plus plus that uh, Antoine uh, discussed before. And then the UK, you actually see a decrease in 21 relative uh, to, uh, to 2019 due to the fact that energy prices uh, uh, actually uh, had increased and therefore uh, you know the, the 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 support is actually uh, you know the the gap for the uh, contract for different was actually uh, much narrower so the, the support actually given was less now uh, the rest is mainly going through manufacturing uh, and then uh, through horizontal measure and, and you see that again uh, a lot of difference uh, across country let me mention for example denmark uh, lots of the support is going for wind uh, turbine in the energy sector italy lots of it is going for example to uh, photovoltaic energy uh, production uh, and, and so you know you see that th there is an element of, of uh, sectoral component here uh, that is important for the green transition, but not only. Let me also mention, and again, I don't want to go too much in the detail, but here we report grant and, and tax incentives. There is also a lot, uh, I mean, a bit less, but still significant, uh, going through uh, financial instruments, support, for example, uh, uh, venture capital for green and so on. Now, uh, this is my last slide, and then I'll stop. Obviously, uh, you know, and, and, and Antoine mentioned this today, uh, support to green goes also through improved technology, both in terms of innovation and diffusion. And in fact, the, the growth of, of, of green support is accompanied by a revival of what we call techno-specific instrument. And let me mention here that in, in, in the case, for example, and, and again, this came uh, about in the previous panel, uh, you know, battery uh, support for batteries. One uh, is one case, for example, in Italy, where through the IPCEI, the uh, important project of community interest, and then no, common European. common European interest. Sorry, I always get it wrong. Uh, you know, the, the case of Italy, for example, uh, for battery plays an important role, and then similarly uh, in France as well. So uh, you see that there is an element there where we really focus uh, the support on, 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 on particular uh, technology. Let me thank you. I want to leave more time for the panel. Uh, I showed you the report. It's available online. Uh, we also have the country notes, and in particular, we have the database uh, that gives you all the data that uh, underlies the figures that I showed. So thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Well, for you. While I have you there, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use your expertise right here to, to answer one question. I think you've, you've made it so clear that 
you know, what we're seeing in so many ways is interventions in one place beget needs, new needs, and then potentially new intervention in other areas. And I was very glad to see the jobs and skills piece in there because as you point out, that's not as equally shared across the board. With this data set, and I know you're clearly working on expanding it, You've, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a cut across in time. Can you say with some sort of certainty what you feel works, at least for this moment in time and for this political context, or is that too a target that moves in time and space? I don't think we are at the stage where we can say what works. I think we are now at the stage uh, when we can say where money is going. And so I think one uh, immediate use is, as I said, to look across the different measures and the different priorities and see if they are coherent. So this is far from, okay, this works, this doesn't work, but perhaps we can see where if the money is going into, for example, uh, you know, let's say investing in digital hardware, are we spending in digital skills? And you know, by collecting all this information, I mean, we didn't report it here, but we also have some information on design. And again, you know, perhaps you can see whether what, as a country, you are doing is actually best practice relative to other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, am I giving the money in the same way as other countries are giving? Perhaps I should use more financial instrument. Perhaps I could use tax. So I think that's where we are. We are not yet at the stage of really telling countries this work, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But this is where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. Well, I think your, your data goes a long way to having these people think about that, um, which allows me to turn to the panel. But for the moment, please uh, join me in thanking yeah. Chiara again. I wanted to introduce all my panelists to you, but I'm going to start with Banhat in just a second uh, to ask some probing questions, not least because this has been sort of banner uh, week in German industrial policy and it raises a lot of questions about precisely strategy and, you know, connectedness. And it connects directly with Josefina because, of course, we now also have an economic uh, security strategy coming out of uh, the European Union. Um, so to my left is Bernhard Klutik. He's the head of industrial policy, the industrial policy unit at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Very busy man this week. Uh, Philip Luck is the deputy chief economist at the US Department of State, because I think, again, to have the State Department represented here says everything about the fact that industrial policy does not exist in some sort of hermetic isolation. So welcome, Philip, and thank you for coming all the way over. And then uh, Josefina Monteguero is the deputy head of the chief economist team at the DG Internal Market Industry Entrepreneurship and SMEs at the EU Commission and has the longest business card on this panel. And then, of course, uh, Chiara is joining us on this panel as well to weigh in with uh, some of the insights of her research. Banhat, um, just picking up, you know, from the headlines, shall we say, uh, the Intel decision, which raised and rankled a lot of um, German economists, certainly, because they were looking at, to, to the point about jobs and skills, how important are these jobs and skills that have just been subsidized in that way and is germany making it is there a strategy behind these kind of uh, industrial investments when you have a swiss solar panel manufacturer that on the heels of this intel decision immediately turns around and says oh yes well in that case you know either you give us the same kind of subsidies and and thoughts or we'll run off to the united states and embrace what president biden has put on the table so Strategies are always trade-offs, as we heard from Kara very eloquently, of political priorities, since the state is back in the game of business, uh, but resources, capacity for foresight, and then, of course, none of these decisions are happening in a, in a, in a vacuum, and we'll talk about with Philip about China and the United States and how that interplays. So can you peel back the onion a little bit of, of how you're thinking about this in the ministry? Um, and, and the signaling that you're hoping maybe went out of these three or four banner events uh, this week. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Maybe I try this one. Yes, this one works. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, it is uh, yesterday. I was uh, on a panel discussion uh, on the 
a paper that we uh, published a couple of weeks ago on the special uh, electricity price for um, energy intensive industries was also a very intense discussion um, and um, and well it is it is really from for me as a, a director general for industrial policy it's really good to see that uh, you don't have to feel ashamed anymore if you uh, say, oh, I'm working on industrial policy. So it's um, basically everybody is talking about industrial policy and um, um, uh, you don't just have to say, oh, I'm working for the Ministry for Economic Affairs. No, you really can say, I'm working for uh, the industrial policy department. And um, why has uh, industrial policy uh, become so important? Uh, basically, um, two reasons. Uh, first of all, the uh, huge challenges that lie ahead of us uh, with regard to the green transformation and uh, the digitalization. And secondly, the whole geopolitical situation. And um, of course, we have a strategy um, on industrial policy and that doesn't uh, all these things don't uh, happen on a random basis. No, we, we follow a, um, a strategy and we, our main task is to, um, to address these challenges that lie ahead of us. Um, and you just said that I had a busy week. I would say I've been having busy month, um, uh, the last 18 months or so, um, because the Intel decision was just one decision uh, that um, uh, was uh, keeping us busy uh, the last weekend. And um, of course, there has been a lot of criticism on, on that uh, Intel case, uh, but I would say not everybody knows all the details. Um, uh, in fact, we had an agreement with Intel already last year. We found an agreement with Intel already last year. And um, uh, last year, the plan of Intel was to invest 17 billion euros in uh, Germany. And we supported, or we, in, uh, we, we, we promised to support it with uh, 6.8 billion uh, euros. Now the, um, the intended investment, <coughs> the intended investment of Intel almost doubled and we've increased it only by 3.1 uh, billion euros. And what is more important, Intel promised to invest into the latest technology, actually the technology that is not yet on the market. The week before we've launched um, the uh, program on carbon contracts for difference, so that's addressing the green transformation. The week before, we've uh, agreed with uh, ThyssenKrupp to support their uh, investment into direct um, uh, direct reduction plans. So they change from a, a blast furnace steel production to the direct reduction uh, direct reduction plant method. And um, so it's it's always kind of well. We we address the challenges from the. Uh, green transformation from the digitalization and the whole geopolitical situation. Can I no, sorry. Have that back for a second. Um, what, what I think is what I think is so interesting in, uh, about Kiara's data is number one, it's comparative. So again, it looks at how others are doing, and so maybe in the second round you'll enlighten us, and then you know, Josephina I think has the best comparative perspective uh, from her vantage point in Brussels because this gets us back to this idea of what works, giving the endogenous and exogenous pressures. But I think Chiara's point was uh, well taken, particularly in the, in the German context. So I just want to ask you this follow-up. Um, you know, we're, we're known, and, and we saw this in the genesis of the national security strategy, which now also has a big economic component to it, as it should, um, that because there are so many different cooks in the kitchen, um, and need to be in order to quote unquote get this right that that balancing act that foresight capacity is 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 sometimes challenged um, Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're trying to get that right and right size that because we heard also at, at TDI at the at the big BDI conference that you know businesses is, has been pretty critical um, And so how are you squaring that both the negotiation with domestic business 
the looking into the wider piece, but then also the potential knock-on effects between all the different uh, decisions that you make in your house and how they affect other areas of public policy. So trade-offs, effectively, is what I'm asking. Well, um, the uh, the criticism uh, at the TDI um, focused mainly also on the on the uh, lengthy procedures that we have in in, in Germany and as and, and in Europe, and they always compare it to the IRA. I think we will come to this a little bit later. And in the uh, in the US, everything is so easy. You get your tax credit. Um, you just you you can easily calculate uh, what what amount of money uh, you are entitled to. And, um, uh, and in, in Germany and in Europe, everything is very, very complicated. And I, um, well, in, in my department, uh, I'm responsible for six uh, important projects of common European interest. And um, well, overall, the projects are very successful, I, th I, I would say, but, it takes too much time, way too much time. The uh, um, two weeks ago or so, we we've got the approval from the Commission for the second uh, IPCAI uh, on micro um, on semiconductors, microelectronics, and um, we've been waiting for the uh, approval for around about two years, and that is something uh, that the that the industry cannot uh, really except because investments especially in the semiconductor business if you have to wait for your for your for the approval uh, for your funding for two years that's basically well that's ages in in in, in that sector and therefore we have to we have to speed up the uh, procedures and we have to do much better um, with uh, regard to maybe new ipkai programs so Phil, I have so many questions for you that pivot directly uh, off of this, not least because, and we'll talk about the RA in half a second, but the concept of sort of, of, of future-bound industrial policy has been so tightly wrapped in under this administration with United States security. And I think probably the best or most coherent summary in terms of telling this to the American public was likely Jake Sullivan's recent speech uh, at the Brookings Institution, where he effectively laid out a SWOT analysis uh, in terms of United States strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats um, that come from that core uh, uh, sort of economic and industrial policy piece, but have everything to do uh, with U.S. security. And we just heard from Banhat this whole point about the, the IRA. I mean, the IRA is a climate bill. It's a, that's a climate package. Um, let's let's call it what it is. But this idea that it would have to be made easy to say yes to, to win over domestic uh, opponents as well, but then clearly to send also a signal abroad. Um, and I wondered if you could reflect on the intentions of, of the IRA, but then also how that fits into the sort of wider security agenda of the United States and how these elements, as Ben Hodge just said, link and have to link. So how comparative data is useful so that you can know what you might affect home and abroad. <clears throat> sure. Thanks so much. Is it working now? No? Oh, still not? This? Oh, oh, well, yes, oh just we've closer. Got you. Okay, so we've great, got excellent. You. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for putting on this fantastic uh, panel here today, and thank you so much. The paper is fantastic, and uh, really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I think what I would say is I want to zoom out to the thirty thousand foot view for a second. So uh, uh, the IRA is clearly industrial strategy. We are clearly, you know, so I, I really like the definition. I would even go broader. Industrial strategy or policy or whatever you want to call it is anything where the state is changing relative prices with the intention of changing the pattern of production, right? That's clearly what this is. Um, and the question I want to ask is, what, for what reason would a government use such a policy? And I think if you look at uh, what we learned at coming out of the pandemic with uh, supply chains not being as resilient as we thought, what we have known for a long time and are waking up to in a real way around climate change um, and in other ways, these are all externalities, right? We are trying to solve uh, societal problems through collective action, 
right? And we know, as an economist, that markets are just not especially good at solving these problems on their own. We need to have some amount of intervention so that we can marshal the incredibly dynamic forces of markets to create the best social good. And so that's the lens in which I look at the IRA. The IRA is a generational investment uh, in the greening of the U.S. economy. Uh, it puts us, you know, not within shouting distance of, you know, being able to hit our, our, our net zero goals, right? Without that, we, we stood no chance, right? This is an enormous investment. Um, it's going to lead to crowding in even a, an even a larger sum of money. We've already seen the, the, the numbers of private investment just rocket up in the United States, and that's exactly what we want to do. We are not trying to replace industry. We are trying to make, provide the correct incentives, right, um, to solve these externalities, where, again, industry should has no private incentive to take these things into account. Um, when it comes to the broader geopolitical space, I, I would say the exact same thing um, that we've learned through the pandemic, right? Private firms, for, for all the reasons that we can think of, don't have a necessarily always the, the view of the systemic risks, the systemic uh, problems that their sourcing decisions create. Mm -hmm. right? And we are not uh, you know, uh, here to, to, to tell industry what to do, but we do need to create the environment just as we do in the climate space where those risks can be uh, properly accounted for. Um, and so that's the, I would say, you know, when it comes to the CHIPS Act, when it comes to IRA, when it comes to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, these are all um, us just taking seriously the shared challenges we have and trying to address them uh, in the best way we can. And, and I'm glad to hear that industry thinks that uh, IRA is easy. That's great. <laughs> Certain <laughs> parts not, of the yeah, German yeah, industry you know, spectrum. Uh, cough, I, mean, cough. I, I would just say, br broadly speaking, you know, uh, left without any other constraints, I would prefer something easy. So that that's good. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I think it's very clear that the the, the we have decided that um, this type of relatively simple market-based subsidies um, provides firms in industry the right incentives. Uh, and, and critically, the IRA is important because it does so over a long time period, right? So it's 10 years of investment. That's enough time for industry to be able to make sound decisions without, mm -hmm. um, without the risk of, uh, of changes. And to generate the kind of data, comparative data, that we'll, we'll need to answer the simple question I asked Kira before on, on what works. I think we'll, we'll get some clear answers there. So let me just stay with you for just one second because, I mean, just blatantly, if every country uh, that we can think of now arms up with some version of industrial policy, some version of interventions for what we, and Kiara said again, there's a moment in time of data. We don't know yet. Um, you know, that begets circles. We, the political fallout, even with allies, w was immediate um, on the IRA. And we've, you know, we've seen different ways of mitigating that. But um, does everything just become conflict? If we, if it, is that just another avenue for conflict? No, not not, not at all. Um, so so I would say we understand. So I, I think the the reception of the IRA has been fairly positive, very positive. I think there are we take seriously uh, the concerns that our partners have around uh, s some issues around the IRA, and I think we've been working quite successfully to uh, ameliorate those concerns. Um, I would say you can, you certainly could imagine a situation where we get sort of a race to the bottom, right? Where we have just sort of out-competing ourselves in subsidies, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, yeah, um, that is absolutely not where we want to go. Uh, I don't think we're on path to, on, the, on the track to go there. And I would also say that this type of research is exactly the type of thing we need to not do that, right? right? right. Um, I think, again, the, the key point here is we're trying to solve an externality right? And the, especially with climate change, that is a shared challenge, right? So if we design a p policies appropriately, we can all work together to solve those problems, right? Without creating sort of um, uh, additional inefficiencies in markets, right? Um, uh, I guess I can leave it to you. Well, we used to do a lot of this through some of the multilateral institutions we built for ourselves. So I, I'm clearly being provocative for a reason, because now we're turning it over to Josefina, who is the representative of one of so said multilateral institutions that we built ourselves in the European Union, where exactly this comparative work 
gets done uh, and is also linked to the security nexus, as we saw uh, with the release of, of the strategy this week. Kiara's data on Europe painted a really mixed picture uh, of where we are. So, Josefina, as you look at, at this data, and of course I imply this in my question to Phil, but China making all sorts of unilateral decisions, and in some respects one might argue that this heavy investment in the way in the West we're looking at industrial policies because institutions like the WTO no longer work in the way that they maybe could or should to mitigate some of these issues. As you look at the data and as you look at what your ambitions are within the commission, which are very ambitious, and you see what's happening across the pond, how do you throw your arms around that uh, in terms of what you see right now or what could happen in, in the immediate future? Are you engaged in a subsidy race to the bottom already or can you make good on your strategic plans? Thank you. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Chiara, for the really great paper. I had to say, as you said, I look at the numbers, so I really look at... I even have notes everywhere, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I really... Yeah, it was uh, very, very, very nice reading. Um, yes, uh, what do we take out of this uh, analysis and how do we see it moving forward? I, 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 and whether we are already facing a, a race to the bottom uh, in terms of subsidies. Actually, I want to link my answer to something that Chiara said at the, at the beginning and also to something that Philip said. Um, the first thing is that, you say, Chiara, we are in a changing world, and industrial policy is changing. It's something totally different. And uh, what we see different is not only the traditional competitiveness, this is still the aim, okay? But now we, we are adding an enormous onus on industrial policy because it needs to deliver competitiveness, okay? But it needs to deliver the green, on the green transition. Not only that, and this is a bit the link with the, with the security, economic security aspect, is that since COVID, we also understood that we were extremely vulnerable to, to foreign dependencies and certain strategic dependencies. So then we added an additional goal to our industrial policy. And I, to me, actually, that was really the moment where the new industrial policy that we are here discussing really, really started. Because then we understood is that, okay, so we have to deal with these dependencies, which are strategically important. So it's not only the externalities that Philippe was talking about, no? about the ensuring the, the green transition. Now it's also the adding, um, how do we align, for example, in terms of supply chain resilience, or how do we align our policy objective as policymakers, which is ensuring from an economic, wide economic and societal viewpoint resilience, with the rightly objectives of firms who uh, do not necessarily have this uh, overall resilience of the economy in mind. Not at all, where probably the best from a firm's perspective strategy may be to engage with uh, risky countries or risky partners, so to speak. From a company's perspective, it's optimal, but not from a societal or for a policy maker. So how do we align? the incentives at private and at public level. So to me, when you put all that together, what you have is a lot of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. You have competitiveness, you have, we need to ensure this resilience at macro level, that needs to be consistent with the micro level resilience and front level, and then at the same time, we want to be sustainable, we want to be green. So, so there are em emerging trade-offs, uh, uh, that are uh, difficult to square, and I think this is going to be really challenging. Um, from the Commission, what, what we have been trying to do, uh, uh, parenthesis, actually, you, uh, Philippe, you presented the IRA as a green strategy. To tell you the truth, to me, it's a green strategy, but it's very much driven by strategic uh, autonomy consideration because uh, part of the building and kind of the coupling from some risky, uh, vulnerable third countries is also at the heart of what is driving the IRA, as it is 
at the heart of what is driving the European response. So I will, I will add that indeed the, these uh, security concerns are becoming also part of the equation. Um, so to the, ah, the race, uh, on the race to the bottom, well, first of all, uh, on the question about pa uh, Chiara's paper, because actually, since I really read it, I enjoy it very much, uh, I want to say that um, what we see for the moment is the first step. And indeed, what we need to see is the next one, okay, which is to what extent all this is effective. And then we can decide which policy tools are more effective. But I want to add already a consideration when thinking about these uh, policy tools that, uh, that Chiara and, his call, uh, and her colleagues, they, they look at. Um, and this is related to the Europeans' uh, reaction. It's not only about money. I understand money is what you can measure, it's obvious. Um, and, and, the, and the IRA, to some extent, is really is the big bang of money. So <laughs> that's that. But the European response, actually, it's broader than just money. Yeah. So it is the money component, which will be very nicely captured by, by, by Keras and, and the uh, framework. But then there are other three pillars of our response that I want just to mention very quickly. The second one, and I think it's, it's very important in reaction to this uh, IRA being so simple, is actually uh, the regulatory diminishing, making things easier. That's one of the goals. And actually, in the, in the recent um, strategy that they, com that they in May 2023, on the green industrial deal, uh, that was one of the, uh, really, the, 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 the pillars that were uh, that we were put forward, and the idea was indeed to react to the complaints from the private sector that indeed, why so complicated in Europe? And one of the things that we are doing indeed is with member states, because at the end, some things could be at, at, at the level of the uh, commission, but is, in most cases, actually, is at the level of member states, is indeed, for example, the accelerating licensing and permitting. And the, so this is one of the pillars. It's the regulatory pillar that cannot be captured by by quantification of money, and I think it's important to be our in mind. Another pillar of our strategy is actually skills and jobs. Mm -hmm. The skills that are needed is not only, and I think, um, I don't know exactly who mentioned the example that, okay, you are investing in, in digital, maybe it was over coffee. You are investing in digital, uh, in digital infrastructure, um, for example, or software, or but at the same time, you are not investing in the skills that you need. Mm -hmm. So then you have a clear mismatch. So skills are also important. And the fourth is actually the international partnerships. And this is a bit the link of uh, um, how you need to make sure is, uh, that the raw materials, for example, that you need to secure your strategic autonomy, your green transition actually are available. How do you do it? Yeah. While at the same time, you need to square all this circle of competitiveness, green, strategic autonomy. So it's through a lot of international partnerships. So I just want to say that these are dimensions that I think at this stage, and, and it's rightly so, of course, because the objective of the, of the framework is indeed the quantification of, of what is spent, is expenditure. But just to say, I think we need to go when, especially when looking at priorities, we need to be a bit careful because what is emerging in terms of priorities from the quantification, okay, it's funding priority, but that doesn't mean necessarily that these are the priorities, right. uh, European priority, because there are other tools that are being put in place that are equally important. Yeah, now we've heard from both of you, or from two of you, from Panhat and you, how interesting it's going to be to figure out a way to quantify, uh, you know, the back rolling of administrative rules and hurdles. And we heard uh, Minister Habeck say that very clearly, that that's his next große Baustelle. Um, you know, big, uh, if you've moved through Berlin, you know what a große Baustelle is, meaning to say, uh, you know, the, the big uh, building block component. So Chiara, OECD has more work to do. Um, uh, Chiara, I wanted, I wanted to see if you wanted to weigh in on, on what you've heard. Uh, then I'm going to go one quick round with the panel, but Nicola is already showing up hands, which is because our colleagues on Zoom are with us and they have questions. So we're going to go to that in two minutes. And of course, that's your time to ask questions too. We have 20 minutes exactly 
in uh, this conversation. So everybody, I love this. Look at everybody's got their hands ready already. So maybe I'll skip my second round and, and just weave it into other people's questions. Kira, did you want to weigh know, in on me, what you heard? Let me just say that I couldn't agree more with what was said by the rest of the panel. And in fact, uh, I mean, one thing I would like to stress is that the devil is in the design of policies and, and to look at the effectiveness and you know value for money we need to add that uh, sort of bit of the puzzle uh, to the picture that we are trying uh, to, to draw from, from you know, what we see. The second one is that industrial policy does not operate in a vacuum. And so, you know, the, the competition policy, and, and I see Tommaso here, I'm sure he, he will want to add on these uh, trade policies, they all play a role. And, 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 you know, to really get at the question on international coordination and, and effectiveness, that's something that we will have to work on. So, you know, it's not, I would say, uh, we are comprehensive on measuring expenditure, but we have more work and more, I would say, extensions that lie ahead of us to really be able to answer some of the questions that you raised today. So, mm -hmm. lots of work. Okay. <laughs> well, as, so as we hand over to the questions, I'll just give this for the back of your mind and you can fold it in. I want to ask a, a, a question about venue. Where do we have these discussions of alignment? Um, we've packed it now into the EU TTC, which already has a huge agenda, both the mapping of things like critical materials, uh, you know, things that we can do together um, to uh, Josephina's part. But where do we get this alignment? Um, and that's a diplomatic question, which is why I'm looking at, at uh, Phil, <laughs> because he has playing two, two roles here. Um, if it's not necessarily through the multilateral architecture, what does it do to the transatlantic relationship? Um, so just hold that in your mind, uh, and then we'll go, we'll, you know what we'll do? We'll do two in-person questions and one from Zoom. Nicola, does that work for you? Because you're sitting right next to a question right there, can I ask you to pass the microphone? And please introduce yourself. And uh, I come from the old Harvard tradition of questions, which is to say, no long statements. You have, your voice has to go up at the end, and it has to end in a question mark. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Tommaso Duzo from TAW, um, and Chiara knows me too well. Um, uh, and my question is related to your question on uh, international coordination, but a bit smaller, so European coordination. So yeah. you talk about uh, 10... Uh, billions uh, euros uh, yesterday mr habeck said you know we do it because we are the only one who can do that right so uh, i live in germany i'm italian i can tell you italian would not like that because we think that we are in european union there is a state aid so how uh, how difficult is to think about industrial policy at a european level so how would be the reactions? What do we have to do to go uh, beyond the national interests? Simple, straightforward, and difficult. Nicola, go ahead with okay. your questions from Zoom. Two questions uh, from, the, um, from the digital audience. One is, I suppose, to perhaps everybody, but a bit, a bit more to, to Chiara, perhaps, and it links to what um, Josefina just said. The question is, well, you know, if you look at these industrial policies and all the spending, wouldn't it be better to improve the ease of uh, doing business and um, shortening um, planning procedures, uh, etc.? because in the end somebody has to pay for all these industrial policies. Mm -hmm. And the second one from Nicolas Martin, which goes to Bernard Klutik and uh, Phil Luck at the same time, he's asking, well, given that the West, he calls it the West, so the U US and the EU and some other countries, have a common interest in uh, getting a hold of certain critical technologies like chips, uh, shouldn't there be more coordination between different uh, industrial strategies? Okay, good. Well, that all fits like a glove to what I asked before. So um, why don't we go down the line in backward constellation, Josefina, because it started with European coordination, international coordination. So uh, we can go in from there. Chiara, if you have a point on that too, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, okay. On the, so, there were, so there is coordination uh, across countries, so member states, I think that was one of the questions, and the other is international coordination on industrial policy. So on the um, coordination across countries, and in particular you mentioned state aid, um, okay, so the, the truth is that not every country has the same fiscal space, and this is at the heart if they, of the different reaction when it comes to supporting the private business. 
uh, across countries. So that's, that's a reality. So because we are not a fiscal union, we are not the US, okay? So we, we are not, uh, we don't have the, 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 uh, the capacity that, that the, U, uh, the, the, U, uh, the US have. The, the, in my view, there are two ways to minimize uh, possible, I mean, there are many possible spillovers in the, because Germany is, uh, the case of Germany that you mentioned, is very well integrated into, so everything that happened in Germany will have positive spillovers, so I think this is something we also need to, to factor in, and actually we look into that, and we try to see a bit the kind of uh, the positive spillovers that they will generate. But in terms of uh, what you are, that you, you were mentioning, um, the best tool that we are designing a bit to support countries that may have uh, less fiscal space to support firms is the sovereign fund. And that will be EU level, uh, the EU level fund that we have, an, that the Commission has announced it. Uh, the idea is indeed, because we don't have, we are not a fiscal union, is to kind of compensate if indeed there is a need that, uh, like some countries may have more uh, man, margin of maneuver than others. So the idea of the sovereign fund is actually that one. So it's to, to support those uh, countries that may have less fiscal space. Um, and then, uh, I, I don't know. There was a know question many. about, I don't know if you want to say more on the reduction of red tape and where you've seen it work in the EU that you might want to see elevated to general practice. That was a question that came up. Yeah. Well, I think um, on that, uh, we are really targeting, so the, the, right now we are targeting uh, those areas that are the priority areas, so I, I would like to see, but this is actually what we are really in discussion with countries, it's in everything that is needed to kind of um, unleash the, the transition that we need. So is, there is a lot of focus, for example, on, on, the, on sand uh, sustainable mining, so how to get permits and licensing, so this is not about lowering standards, but about speeding up the, 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 the authorization schemes that may be needed to uh, sustainable mining of raw material, because there are in Europe, but of course, I mean, it was, more prefer it was cheaper to bring it from China, but okay, so now there will be, um, there is a different consideration, cost is not everything, so, but how do we accelerate that this sustainable mining takes place if indeed all this authorization, so it's speeding up that, and the same applies to, uh, to of course, like uh, eight, um, green technologies, like uh, you mentioned, I mean, so, solar panels, wind turbines, um, hydrogen, so the idea, well, but particularly I think that the wind turbines and, and solar panels is right now on the spotlight in terms of accelerating right. the, the permits and licensing. So we are, I think this is in the, there is a general need, of course, to decrease regulatory burden across the board, easiness of doing business, uh, but I think in terms of where to target and priorities, that, that, that's what we are doing, and I think that's in the totally aligned with the, the new priorities. Philip, is the, is the U.S. looking globally into into these issues, best practice, positioning itself as a positioning itself as learning in this? Josephina just showed us how they're trying to learn. Uh, yeah, I think so. And, um, so I'll, let me get back to that just in one second, but I want to follow up on mm -hmm. so two things. One, uh, the question about sort of should there be more. Um, uh, coordination. I actually think, especially within the, the CHIPS ecosystem, there's been quite a bit of coordination, uh, across, both across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. That we have the, the Fab Four with Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, which is, I, I love that name. Um, and, uh, the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and we have very, our Commerce Department has great dialogues with all of our partners in this, so I think we're actually doing a very good job there. Um, I think, uh, and, and hopefully that level of communication can kind of come to that point about leadership in this space. Um, I also would say, so it, it's interesting, so I, I, uh, I cast the problem earlier as a problem of externalities, and, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of the way I look at it as, as an economic economist. And, um, but I also view uh, the, the security issue as essentially an externality problem, right? Because even when you were talking, you were like, well, the, the, the incentives of the firm are not aligned with the incentives of the state. And it's like, well, that's exactly an externality, right? So the problem here is that, you know, there are, there are part, parties, uh, states, or sorry, uh, firms, who are not taking into account um, the systemic risk they might be creating by, you know, uh, 
where they source from or how they source. Um, so those are problems that we all need to solve. And I think hopefully we can have a, quite a bit of communication and coordination around those shared challenges. Now it doesn't mean we're gonna get it right, right? Mm -hmm. We still need to like do the hard work right. of doing that coordination. We still need to do the work of, you know, as soon as you start to take things out of markets, you, you absolutely leave yourself open to creating inefficiencies. Um, and especially when we're funding industries where, you know, a fab costs, one single fab costs unfathomable amounts of money, um, you know, you can make investments poorly, right? So we really need to invest in the knowledge base, invest in the coordination in order to make these these investments um, uh, good, right? And again, this gets back to quiz, which I think is where this can really come in. This is, you, we can't, and it was earlier, earlier someone mentioned, you know, um, where do we have these conversations, right? Well, first, you can't even have the conversations if you're not talking about the same thing, right? right? So at some point, we got to define what we're talking about, yep. right? And so that's where quiz comes in. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I think the OECD is a very good place for these types of conversations, right? This would not be the first time that countries come together to discuss, to discuss shared challenges where there's sometimes contentious issues around those challenges and the first step is just getting your hands around the problem and quantifying it and then eventually you can start to think about how we tackle these shared challenges in, in a sort of in a shared way. Um, you know, the, the US government currently has no position on, on quiz, um, but we certainly are, have bought into those basic um, ideas, right? So whether it be BEP around, you know, uh, tax evasion or whether it be the IF MCA uh, around basically trying to build uh, you know an evidence-based way of thinking about what are the best ways to mitigate carbon. Um, you know, this is these are the types of things we do. And again, if we're going to wake up to challenges of geopolitics and you know resilient supply chains and climate risk and technologies that create human um, human rights uh, concerns, right? Uh, if we're going to have all these concerns and we're going to play, states are going to play a slightly more active role in solving those problems, we also need to coordinate and, and I think the OECD is a very good place for that. Mm -hmm. Panhat, you had all these questions. Place, trade-offs, European coordination, your thoughts. I'll give you my mic. Thank you. Uh, first on, on, on European coordination, I, I think um, um, there is a European coordination and um, we have worked very closely together with um, France and other member states and with the European Commission uh, on all these issues um, that re revolve around the answer to the uh, IRA. So the new um, uh, Green Deal industrial plan, the Net Zero Industry Act, the Critical Raw Materials Act and the um, Temporary Crisis and Transition Framework. So we, we work together with the Commission very closely and I think that is also, um, well, that that's that's very close coordination of uh, of industrial policies um, with regard to the state aid and the fiscal space if Christian Lindner said here uh, um, instead of me he would deny that we had any fiscal space okay. um, but um, <laughs> but um, um, I, I think there are a few points that you have to take into account um, when it comes to this um, well, to this issue of Germany with the deep pockets and uh, um, only Germany um, has the potential uh, fiscal space to, to uh, incentivize the investments. First of all, the IPCAI um, programs, um, they, are, they are coordinated and there, are, um, um, there is um, guaranteed that not only one member state um, can uh, benefit of it uh, from it, but um, but all that participate. Okay, I have to admit the uh, IPCAI um, microelectronic um, that was approved by the Commission last week or so of the hundred projects um, that are within the IPCAI microelectronic, thirty-one are taking place in Germany. So that's a big share. But if you have a look on the semiconductor industry in Europe, then you see that there is a, a, a core a ecosystem in, in Germany, there's a core in, uh, in, in France, around Grenoble, there's something going on in Ireland, and there's something going on in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. And taking that into account, it is very obvious that 
if you invest into this area, then it makes sense to invest um, at, at the uh, places where where you also have uh, where you already have um, um, some ecosystem. And um, when it comes to these huge investments like Intel or maybe TSMC or others, then I think the question is not whether this investment would happen in Germany or in Portugal. The question is whether it would happen in Germany or not in Europe. And therefore, I think um, it is um, justifiable that, um, well, that those countries that have a huge industrial core have to invest more in industrial policy than others. And, um, but nevertheless, when we made our proposals to the European Commission um, with regard to the Net Zero Industry Act and the, and the Critical Raw Materials Act, we also proposed to strengthening the, uh, the European programs, such as the European Investment Fund. Um, no, Innovation Fund, the European Inno Innovation Fund, for instance. And we made this proposal for a, a European platform on, um, uh, on uh, green technologies. And uh, um, we uh, presented this in the um, Competitiveness Council last year in September, I think. Um, and, um, and the Commission... Um, took up this proposal and uh, now it's like part of the Net Zero Industry Act. So I think we always have to go in parallel. We have uh, to allow the member states uh, with a strong industrial base to support uh, further investments, but we also have to strengthening the European programs in order to um, support member states with less fiscal space. Uh, you can tell why this conference has such vividness. I think we could probably go on for another two hours here to probe these things. But in fact, we have about three and a half minutes uh, left on the clock. So uh, we have time for one question and a speed round. And I'm very clearly going to pick on a woman uh, because we have yet to hear from a woman. So uh, the next question comes, the next and last final question comes from you. Thank you very much. Um, Jessie Scott from Davy and the Hertie School. And it's really a question for Chiara about next steps and methodologies. Green hydrogen was mentioned on the previous panel. And there's a big difference between the US IRA approach and our approach in Europe. In summary, in the US, you've offered a sliding scale of tax credit incentives. If you supply hydrogen, regardless of its color, there's a bit of an incentive. If it's electrolytic in origin, there's a bigger incentive. If it's renewable than electrolytic, there's a bigger incentive, etc. In Europe, we've been much more fundamentalist. Additionality, temporality, location. Okay, so how do you measure, when you look at the effectiveness of policies, the difference between these approaches, and not just for their attractiveness for business? I mean, I, I can see the answer there, that's pretty clear but also their effectiveness for our green objectives. Because really where I'm going with this in Europe is, are we making the perfect the enemy of the good? Um, or is there a green line mm -hmm. which you have to cross in order to qualify as green? So I'm posing you a lot of methodological questions, but very excited by the project. Thank so you. we are going to end uh, with Chiara, who's going to do the exact point landing, but we're effectively going to pass the mic down once quickly, because I think everybody on this panel was touched with that question. Everybody gets literally 15 seconds to answer Ben Hutz. <laughs> it's always difficult to compare apples with yes. <laughs> Uh, it's inc it's inc this is good luck with answering this question. Uh, it's incredibly hard. Um, I think this is step one in what I would imagine to be hundreds of steps, basically. But yes, we can't we can't ask, answer those questions before before measuring anything. So that's step one. Yeah. What there's kind of yeah that Kara has has work until she retires. Sorry. That. <laughs> So just to say, we started a bit of this work, and I'm, I'm looking at Guy and, and Antoine, and we have 
we are going to invite you actually, and uh, Antoine mentioned on the 27th, where we started looking at some of these questions in the sort of resilience funds, and, and we have more work than expects us. I think one thing I would like to add, we have spent a lot of time looking at supply measures. I think one of our next goal is to look at demand side, demand pool measures, and you know, procurement being one. And that I think is where some of your points are going to appear quite clearly. Super, thank you. Great. I no longer have a microphone, so I will project. Oh, um, Philip, to the re Philip to the rescue. Uh, I just want to thank all of you. I literally think we could have easily gone on for uh, the remainder of this conference, but I know you have to talk about pertinent issues like AI and how that develops and weighs in on some of these questions. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you to my excellent panel. Please join me in thanking them for their thoughtful comments.